Hi from Heirloom Books at 6239 North Clark Street in Chicago, Illinois. I'm Jeff Helgeson, and today I'm continuing with some observations about Romanticism and the two generations of English writers which are most associated with that term. Just for starters, a number of things immediately come to mind regarding the lives of the Romantic poets. These include political radicalism, abandoned lovers and children, unrealized utopian schemes in the wilds of North America, opium addiction, excessive overcompensations in all aspects of life for an unfortunate birth defect, varying degrees of incest and potential madness, adultery, suicide, bisexuality, simultaneous unplanned pregnancies with multiple partners, self-imposed exile, orgiastic evenings at a lakeshore villa resulting in both the conception of vampires and the novel Frankenstein or the modern Prometheus, accidental drowning and cremation on an Italian beach, death by tuberculosis while suffering from unconsummated desire in such exotic settings as a small apartment at the base of the Spanish Steps in Rome, and the succumbing to fever in a military camp while supporting the Greek struggle for independence from Turkish rule. Still, during the past couple of centuries, it is probably somewhat fair to say that there have, in fact, been truly countless numbers of people whose ex-lovers might easily have described them as mad, bad, and dangerous to know. But they, in virtually every instance, have become total non-entities whose lives were forever interned with their bones and never brought to mind by anyone other than the relatively few people who may have had the misfortune of knowing them personally within their lives. The difference, of course, between the world's vast host of anonymous profligates, adulterers, and drug addicts as compared to such individuals as William Wordsworth, Samuel Taylor Coleridge, Percy Bysshe Shelley, his second wife Mary Wollstonecraft Goodwin Shelley, and John Keats is the writing that they produced. Although interest in the details of their respective personal lives has often drawn more attention than many of the works they created during the century and a half or so since their deaths, with as many as eight biopics ranging from Pandemonium about Wordsworth and Coltridge, available for $94.95 on Amazon.com, Gothic, and Haunted Summer about Byron and the Shelleys, to Bright Star, about John Keats' unfulfilled romance, not to mention 190 vampire movies and 56 motion picture interpretations of Frankenstein monster. It's the writing produced by these individuals that really justifies attention to their lives. For most of the... Uh, biographical intrigues and intricacies, there are two massive books, each titled Lives of the Poets, one by Louis Ottenmeyer, published in 1959, and the other by Michael Schmidt from 1998. However, to borrow a notion from I.A. Richards' practical criticism, what very well might be fundamentally important about the various romantics is the individual text that they created and which have lent significance to the particular details of their lives. In terms of insight, for example, William Wordsworth's observation that the child is father to the man and John Keats' assertion that a thing of beauty is a joy forever seem each to have a universal level of credibility, even if the factual horrors of human history may largely contradict Keats's famous equation of truth and beauty. Beginning with 
the original anonymous publication of lyrical ballads in 1798, the year Napoleon came to power in France, a new type of poetry consisting of two interrelated approaches was established. As explained in subsequent editions of that text in 1800, 1802, the year Napoleon sold off half the North American continent to Thomas Jefferson, and 1805, the year after Napoleon crowned himself Emperor of France and Ludwig van Beethoven scratched out a dedication to Bonaparte from the Aurora Symphony. What these authors, William Wordsworth and Samuel Taylor Coldridge, provided was a subjective set of perceptions in terms of both a deeply personal response to experience of the natural environment and, with Coldridge's Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner, an awe-inspiring sense of the supernatural. In particular, from my point of view, at any rate, aside from what Coldridge contributed, it was Wordsworth's poem, Lines Composed a Few Miles Above Tintern Abbey, founded in 1131 within an area of Wales that, by Wordsworth's time, had become very heavily industrialized, which set the tone for most of what was to follow within the Romantic movement. As um, Margaret Drabble points out, The whole poem is a complicated, passionate outpouring from an entirely personal angle within which almost every sentence begins with I, and Drabble further asserts, it is the value and meaning of the scene that he is trying to describe, not its outward appearance, not how many trees there were in the woods or the color of the sky or the noise of the river. He is painting a picture not of a landscape with river and trees, but of something much more complicated. He is trying to describe the inner workings of his own mind. Now, it's this sense of the subjective internal experience of things that largely predominates much of what is termed romanticism. That tone of mind is central to Wordsworth's massive autobiographical work, The Prelude, within book 10 of which he describes his experience being in France at the time of its revolution, stating, Bliss it was in that dawn to be alive, but to be young was very heaven. This same sense of self is also evident within Wordsworth's most frequently anthologized verses from the 1807 poems in two volumes containing I wandered lonely as a cloud with its wonderful dance among the daffodils. Conclusion, my heart leaps up when I behold a rainbow in the sky. The world is too much with us, late and soon getting and spending. And for an unapologetic lover of nature, the very interesting poem composed upon Westminster Bridge, 1802. Earth has not anything to show more fair. Dull would be he of soul who could pass by a sight so touching in its majesty. This city now like a garment doth wear the beauty of the morning, silent, bare, ships Towers, domes, theaters, and temples lie open under the fields and to the sky, all bright and glittering in the smokeless air. Never did sun more beautifully steep in his first splendor, valley, rock, or hill. Never saw I, never felt 
a calm so deep the river glideth at his own sweet will dear god the very houses seem asleep and all that mighty heart is lying still as for samuel taylor coldridge even though adam seisman's group biography titled the friendship dealing with coldridge and wordsworth along with that poet's sister dorothy and sister-in-law sarah hutchinson was reviewed under a heading referencing the 1969 erotic dramedy bob and carol and ted and alice as bill and dot and sam and sarah and wordsworth deleted coldridge's name from later publications of the lyrical ballads there were still the rhyme of the ancient mariner frost at midnight dejection and ode and the perhaps highly erotic Kublai Khan, not to mention both philosophy and literary criticism, all of which serve to justify attention well beyond the confessed opium eater's personal life. Appearing in the first publication of Lyrical Ballads, The Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner, according to Seisman, was intended to be greater even than John Milton's Paradise Lost. And to show the way to man's redemption through the discovery of a reverence for the simple fact of life itself, even in its most lowly forms. Also in lyrical ballads, Frost at Midnight expresses the secret ministry of a father looking down upon his cradled child during the middle of a cold and quiet night, while Dejection and Ode was written four years later, originally as a letter to Sarah Hutchinson expressing Coldridge's feelings of hopelessness as a grief without pang due to circumstances that American country and Western vocalist Dottie West uh, expressed in a song titled, It's Sad to Belong to Someone Else When the Right One Comes Along. With regard to Kublai Khan, the story of its composition is that the poem was inspired by a dream, perhaps an opium-induced dream, after reading a description of a summer palace located in northeast China, the transcription of which was then alleged to have been interrupted by a, uh, a bill collector. Its imagery, a stately pleasure dome, caverns measureless to man, a sunless sea, fertile ground with walls and towers girdled round, woman wailing for her demon lover, as if this earth in thick, fat pants were breathing a mighty mountain momentarily forced up the sacred river, caves of ice, honeydew, and the milk of paradise. I suppose are up to a reader to interpret. Just over a decade following an additional reprinting of lyrical ballads in 1812, the year Napoleon invaded Russia, the poet George Gordon Lord Byron woke to find himself famous after the publication of the first two cantos of his Child Herald's Pilgrimage a further installment of which inspired Hector Berlioz to write his 1834 orchestral scenes with solo viola titled Herald in Italy. Then, in 1814, when first laying eyes on his cousin's wife at a party in London, Byron wrote his famous She walks in beauty, like the night of cloudless times and starry skies, and all the best of dark and bright meet in her aspect and her eyes. Continuing his career in two weeks during June of 1816, 
year after Bonaparte's defeat at Waterloo. Byron wrote The Prisoner of Xi'an, and in 1821 he completed a play about the world's first supposed murderer, Cain, in addition to, from 1819 to the time of his death in 1824, having published installments of the work he called Don Johnny, a picturesque satire about the fictional Spanish seducer and all-around reprobate Don Juan, who Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart had depicted in his 1787 opera Don Giovanni. For Byron, however, the notorious lover is shown to be an innocent victim of circumstances who, like the author himself, was prematurely introduced to sexuality as a young boy, for Byron by a nymphomaniac Calvinist governess, providing an opportunity for the poet to address some of the following themes. The vanity of ambition, the pretentiousness of the Lakers, Coldridge and Wordsworth, who Byron termed a nest of tuneful persons, like four and twenty blackbirds in a pie, the brutality of war, the hollowness of glory, and the hypocrisies of both religion and politics, as well as allowing for numerous excursions into various speculative ideas and personal prejudices. With regard to Percy Bysshe Shelley, who, as pointed out to me by Randall Alberts, former colleague at Columbia College and the president of the Chicago Literary Hall of Fame, used to do all sorts of experiments in his room at Oxford yeah, before he got kicked out following the publication of a pamphlet titled The Necessity of Atheism. He began his professional career by writing two Gothic novels. In 1813, Shelley wrote his first long poetic work. Queen Mab, a philosophical poem, taking up the topic of the dream-inspiring fairy's midwife described by the character of Mercutio from William Shakespeare's Romeo and Juliet. And in 1821, the year before his death, an essay titled A Defense of Poetry, within which Shelley asserted that poets lift the veil from the hidden beauty of the world, and then proclaim poets themselves to be the unacknowledged legislators of the world. Between these two works, there was Azamandis addressing the time-destroying evidence of human vanity for a British empire upon which the sun was said to never set and demonstrating what about 50 years earlier in the rise and fall of the Roman Empire Edward Gibbon had termed the inevitable consequences of inordinate greatness. Then there was also the Ode to the Western Wind, the verse play Prometheus Unbound, Skylark the Cloud, and Ode to Liberty, along with essays on things ranging from vegetarianism to free love, as well as a translation of Plato's Symposium. It was in the haunted summer of 1816 that the Shelleys' visit to Lord Byron in self-imposed exile on the shore of Lake Geneva in Switzerland inspired Mary's novel, Frankenstein or the Modern Prometheus. And then there was John Keats, whose first publication, Endymion, had been harshly criticized as being too radical within a conservative and reactionary England responding to the French Revolution and the subsequent rise of the Napoleonic challenge to the monarchies throughout all of Europe. In 1821, the same year as Napoleon's death, eh, perhaps as a result of arsenic poisoning while being held captive by the British in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean on an island of St. Helena, John Keats died from tuberculosis at the age of 25. 
two years younger than rock stars Jim Morrison, Janis Joplin, Jimi Hendrix, and Amy Winehouse. According to uh, Henry Newbolt in an introduction to Keats' poems, everything he wrote is clearly the work of a human spirit expressing itself in the presence of others. Most famously, famously within that work is an observation about the endurance of art in the assertion that beauty is truth, truth, beauty from Ode on a Grecian Urn, although this knowledge did not prevent a confusion of Spanish conquistadors, Cortez, and Balboa in the poem on first looking into Chapman's Homer. Also, within the body of Keats' work, there were the Eve of St. Agnes, Ode to a Nightingale, which gave F. Scott Fitzgerald the title of his third novel, Tender is the Night, and Bright Star, expressing a longing to endure forever in a sweet unrest upon his love's ripening breast, or else swoon to death, as well as the amazingly beautiful to Autumn, with its opening line, season of mists and mellow fruitfulness, close bosom friend of the maturing sun, conspiring with him how to load and bless with fruit the vines that round the thatched eaves run. When Keats died in a small apartment next to the boat fountain and the Spanish steps in Rome, Shelley eulogized him as awakening from the dream of life, made one with nature whose soul, like a star, beckons from the abode where the eternal are. Just a year later, Shelley was to join Keats there. Two years after that, Byron would follow. Only Wordsworth of the two primary generations of Romantic poets was to endure on until 1850, outliving Coldridge by 15 years and becoming England's Poet Laureate in 1843, although his most creative period had largely ended some 40 years before during the first decade of the 19th century, confirming Byron's observation in stanzas written on the road between Florence and Pisa that the days of our youths are the days of our glory. Nonetheless, within today's 2020 hindsight regarding issues uh, such as respect for nature, the cumulative inevitable consequence of industrialization, thanks to the phenomenon of global warming, and a postmodernist take on the ethical ambiguities of scientific rationalism, in addition to laying the foundations for American transcendentalism and addressing such topics as the politics of individual human freedom, representative democracy versus resurgent authoritarianism, and even vegetarianism, along with at least uh, as a way to somewhat diminish ongoing contemporary instances of religious violence, the necessity of atheism. Their highly complex personal lives notwithstanding, conceptually anyway, maybe it can be said that the Romantics, with their insights into what Wordsworth termed the still sad music of humanity, expressed in beautiful language what just might have been something very worthwhile. I'm Jeff Helgeson. Heirloom Books is located at 6239 North Clark Street in Chicago, Illinois.